Greetings, this is Jyoti Dodia, and I'm really pleased to have Nigel Griffiths deliver the 102nd session in the Power webinar series. And today, Nigel is going to be covering details about the Power 10 processor uh, for regular techies. So, without any more uh, delay, let me pass over to Nigel. Thank you very much, Jyoti. So, I work for IBM, I'm a technical staff member in the UK. Uh, down the bottom here has got some links for Twitter. I run a open source project called NJMON. I've got blogs and I think it's 215 videos there on YouTube. Lots of topics on power, AIX and related technologies. I'm very pleased to present this session. <laughs> to be honest, it's quite a worry because I'm talking about uh, future technology um, as it arrives. And I've got to be careful not to say things that I'm not allowed to say. So, um, in we go. I'm going to cover the ab abstract. Yeah, the um, we're going to be covering the Power 10 processor on the big commercial servers. They're the typical replacements of the S924 and the E950 and the E980, but running Power 10 chips. And when I say regular techies, I mean systems administrators, people that do performance tuning, DevOps. Solution designers, system architects, that sort of thing. Not the processor architect or the designers or deep dive kernel programmers trying to uh, program the firmware and those sorts of things. So it's just our regular techies that are actually running and using Power 9 at the moment to run services for their users. And we'll go through the publicly available information. I'm not going to be leaking any secret confidential things. And I'm not going to make any announcements in this session. Sorry if that's what you're here for. Um, but we'll have a little look of um, the Power 10 processors. Uh, the information is available. Uh, the Power 10 servers, the information is not available. But I thought what we'll do is we'll pretend that we're going to put Power 10 chips into a Power 9 server to get an idea of what it would look like in the number of CPUs and that sort of things. We also can't cover some things. Partly because I like my job, and if I told you the information, I'd probably get the sack within an hour. Um, but some of it just isn't available. Now, the um, dates, for example, of when the Power 10 servers will come out is not available. But there is a little bit of leakage. Um, a senior vice president said it's going to be the second half of 2021. And one of the videos uh, that is public uh, one of the chip designers says it's going to come out uh, about a year from now. And he made the video in October. So I, I'm not saying anything else apart from that. Uh, the prices, they're kept very secret until the, the last minute um, because they're making adjustments based on what's happening in the marketplace and things. The RPERFs and the CPW ratings, well, those official numbers don't come out until we have what's known as the GA, the Generally Available uh, type of machine. They're the ones that we roll out to our customers. We have to have that actual machine before we can do the performance benchmarks for the final figures. And we have to do it on GA firmware and GA operating systems and GA applications. And, and you know, all of those things are going to be updated and improved until the uh, servers are shipping out. But the gigahertz is another thing. Um, there's a plan for gigahertz. Um, and um, there's nothing like actually trying the machine, seeing how hot it gets and what gigahertz ratings we can safely run our machines at. Now, having said that, um, my colleague uh, Gareth found the gigahertz ratings are actually on Wikipedia, and it gives you a bit of a range, but um, yeah, three and a half to four gigahertz plus, it says. So it's a bit vague. It doesn't really help very much. Another thing we don't know at the moment, although a lot of IBMers are, are trying to guess, the model names, that's a marketing decision. And uh, as the technical people at IBM like to say, well, the marketing names don't have to make any sort of sense, or they'll set a whole lot of rules and then break them the, the following month. Uh, and this gonna we're going to equally cover AIX, IBM I, and Linux on power environments. And uh, we're just looking at the, the raw machines themselves. OK, I think that's enough caveats. Let's get in. There's a hot chips conference uh, once a year. This year it was in August, and it's the 32nd. Uh, conference and two uh, quite famous IBMers, uh, William Starkey and uh, Brian Tomp, too, 
I think that's how you say it. Uh, they're both distinguished engineers, uh, very, very clever people. They have been working on Power 10 for about five years now, uh, the initial design, um, and then uh, bringing it out uh, and getting it to the point where we're actually building the chips, and that, that's all going very well. Uh, these two people have actually done a series of uh, videos, well, two in particular. Uh, one was the Open Power Summit, which is 25 minutes long. And I see on YouTube it's got 1,100 views already. And uh, I've actually taken, I've actually got the presentation, so I've taken some of those slides and used them, and I'm going to not cover all the details, highlight what I think is the most interesting and important points on some of his slides. Um, and they co-hosted this during the first half and the second half of the presentation. There's another version of it, which is 90 minutes long, so it's a full dip. I think this is the the actual session or a repeat of what actually they said in the um, conference, the Hot Chips conference. So it's got all the details. Now that Hot Chip conference is for processor designers and architects. They go into the full details. They make a lot of assumptions about all these terms that they use. Um, I, I know Bill Starkey from buying a beer at a conference. And so I could fire off a few questions and he very politely says, what the heck? Why don't you understand that, Nigel? It's obvious. It's a something or other. Uh, but it might be obvious to him. It's not obvious to, to everybody else. But they're willing to uh, educate us and get me up to speed. So here's a standard uh, technology roadmap. We've been on this path. Well, I, I date back to Power 2. Um, I've been on IBM 28 years now. So we've seen a few of these come out. We're now running Power 9 in uh, our computer rooms. And then we have um, Power 10 is coming out and what we're talking about there. And they have these added highlights in here, and we're going to talk about all of those, I think, but we'll cover those in a minute. So let's get into it. This is Bill's first chart, and you're thinking, well, that's a bit odd. I thought the whole point of a Power 10 chip is it's fast. Uh, but uh, no, he wants to cover other things as well. If you like the powerful enterprise core, that's the fast bit. Uh, bigger caches, flexibility, core architecture has been drastically changed to get better performance. But he want, also wants to highlight there's no point in having, like, putting in an engine double the size if you don't change the uh, other things of the, the car. Um, you know, the carburetors have to be better to actually get the petrol in and out of the, into the engine rather, and then the exhaust pipe, and then the old transmissions and tyres, all of that has to change. So if you want to go faster anyway. So the data plane bandwidths are all been souped up so we can feed the, the powerful enterprise core fast enough and get that data back out onto memory and back out on the disks or out across the uh, networks. End-to-end -end security is important. Um, it, the subject comes up here on the, the virtual user groups quite a lot. We know since Power 9 came out, we've had the Spectre meltdown security nightmare in the effect of everybody in the computer industry. The, um, so we've, we've learned from that, if you like. So in the Power 10 machine, the, the processor, we actually have things now that not only work around the spectre meltdown problem they actually have uh things in there that will also fix any um security issues in, of that type and uh, one of them in particular they're they're going to uh, encrypt memory and you're thinking well that's great because if you've got somebody hacking you the spectre meltdown and getting memory that they shouldn't have access to in power 10 that memory will be encrypted it will just be random numbers you want to say go ahead read any bite you like because you're not going to make any sense of it uh, at all so security is important and we're looking forward to the future that will come up as well also you'll find that we're going to put a lot of cores in a single socket uh, every socket and to do that I even mean, if you put like two power nine chips under the same socket It'd be so hot that it would you know, explode within a couple of seconds with the heat being generated. So the way they're going to increase the number of cores in power 10 is very important to get the energy under control. That's the amount of electrical power that goes into the chip. And so they're making it far more efficient. If we can reduce the amount of electricity going in, then that reduces the amount of heat that it generates and that allows us to go for very high core densities. And then, if you like, since Power 9 came out, we've got a lot more AI. I mean, there's a little bit about what out 
uh, of that around when Powerline first came out, but it's become a, a major uh, influence in the industry. So while they had the Power 10 design open, if you like, they were changing the uh, the energy efficiency, increasing the call speeds, increasing all the bandwidths in there, putting the security stuff in. They also introduced a whole load of extra instructions and data types into the core that can be used for AI workloads on the main Power 10 processor. We'll come back to that right at the end. It's got two or three slides in that. Okay, so here's the uh, the beautiful chip. You all like these uh, pictures. Down the bottom, it says uh, the Samsung Foundry uh, produced this. And we've changed the people that we're using to make our Power 10 chips to Samsung. That's always a little bit risky, isn't it? As any company, you could have sort of communication problems or dislocations on, on terminology and those sorts of things. But uh, talking to um, chip designers, uh, they're very happy with the relationship. That's going really well. And uh, they found that Samsung a little bit more proactive in, in getting things done. So that's going very well, and we're actually producing Power 10 chips now. And you'll notice there it says at the top, I can put these little stars on the things I really want to cover uh, on this particular chart as a reminder. So we're going down to 7 nanometer. This is how thick the tracks are, or the, the individual items are on the chip. S 7 nanometers is fairly scary. And a typical technical person being brutally honest, even when uh, you don't really need to be, they, we now have that 18B, that's 18 billion devices. In the past, we tend to call them transistors, but on these modern cores, there are other things other than transistors on in here. If you want to create some uh, memory, you know, level one, two, or three caches, for example, um, then there's a bunch of transistors and a capacitor to hold the voltage of those sorts of, sorts of things. So they're actually calling them devices now, but that's gone up uh, quite a lot. Now, the other things in here, I've got pages on, on all of those. We can see um, the uh, SMT cores, the different sort of memory, the power axion, the, the buses between the chips, and the PCIe is going up as well. But we'll cover all those in a later slide. So if we want to see how much, what, what does uh, you know, 18 billion mean, Power 9 was only 8 billion, so it's more than double the amount of uh, transistor-like things that we have inside the chip. Power 8 was half of Power 9, Power 7 quite small in comparison. So you can see how these are being ramped up as we put more cores and more caches inside the processor. But it's absolutely amazing that they can make these big jumps in the uh, generation. Now, somebody's saying, what's Power Axion? Well, we'll come back to that in full detail in a minute. Okay. Also, that 7 nanometer, um, if we go back to you know, 10 years, uh, power 4, this is how big a, a transistor is, if you want to look at it that way. And then Power 5, it went down a bit, and Power 6, it went down quite a lot. And you'll notice that it either goes down about a third, or it halves uh, between those, those different uh, generations. So now we're going from 14 for Power 9 to 7 to Power 10. That, that's halving the size of these things, the, the width across them. That's quarter of the real estate that is actually sitting in there for these things. And that allows us to put the um, 18 billion devices into the actual uh, chip. We're going to shrink the chip, or also going to shrink the size of the individual transistors. So the next thing up in here is that there says 15 SMT8 cores well, and the caches and things. So um, the, if you're a bright person, you'll suddenly notice, hang on, there looks on this diagram to have 16 cores but we're only claiming 15 who will actually be available in power 10 times. So, so what's going on there? Well, it turns out that most people want to buy the chips or their servers that go as fast as possible with as many cores active. So if we produce a 16 core chip, everybody will want that one, but it's harder to produce a chip with every core working on it. So I tried to show you this in a diagram that I made up. All right, you can tell the wheelie line. That's how steady my hand is when I was drawing freehand um, in PowerPoint. So illustration purposes only. If you try to make hundreds of um, processor chips, you'll find um, the number of them that is perfect. Everything is actually working. 16 cores is working. It's going to be a lot lower than if you start backing off to lower numbers of cores. In power, well, power seven, eight, and nine, um, 
we tend to sell you the, the top number of cores, but we also offer um, cores with uh, you know eight, ten, twelve uh, cores working in them because we have quite a lot of those um, in the foundry. Uh, they don't quite all the cores can work, or they don't work at the full speed. So um, we have a whole bin full of you know twelve ways and ten ways and eight ways. And so this is why we offer them at slightly lower prices, and and you, and you can sort of we've got the we've got the stocks if you like to supply the chips. So by not offering eighteen, uh, sorry, sixteen cores, but offering offering fifteen, we have a much higher number of those chips available to us. Um, now it tends to be over the years uh, the manufacturers makes very very small uh, changes in the way they actually make the chips. And examples of them are come from cooking. <laughs> if you like, they've designed the formula for your uh, cupcakes or something, and you give it to the cook, and the cook is making subtle changes uh, of things in processes, um, how quickly you heat them up to get the infusion of all the tracks to join up properly. So you, you heat it up to a certain level, keep it at a temperature for you know, 20 minutes, and how quickly you cool it down at the end greatly affects the yields on a particular slice of uh, silicon. So they, they keep making little adjustments and they get more in this diagram, more 15s and 16s will come out over the next couple of years. So there's two ways of, of looking at that. This is my cynical view in here, right? Um, if we offered 16 cores and then we found we couldn't make enough of them, it became very popular and we couldn't make enough of them, we'd get into supply <laughs> problems you know we'd have to tell people we can't ship you the computer in the next two weeks it's going to take uh, six weeks before we got enough chips to to build your computer to ship it out to you and then in the well, i can see in the local press but it's the internet these days isn't it but well, there'd be lots of articles ibm fails to produce power 10 chips yeah, disaster you know um if we do it the other way around if we offer only the 15 uh, core chips we've got lots more of them and so we're not going to get the bad press for failing to deliver enough of them. And who knows, in 10, sorry, 10 years, in two or three years time, and we have lots of the 16 core chips um, uh, saved away, and we're getting higher yields as we've gone, then maybe in two years time, we could offer a 16 core chip, but we're not promising that. That's just me sort of speculating. And then, then the press would be, you know, IBM goes to, give you the extra 16th core, you know, another 10% performance or whatever the number would be. So that would be good press. So we're trying to avoid bad press. We're trying to make it easier so to make chips by going for the 15 core. And I, I believe, I haven't actually confirmed that this is what the mainframe guys have been doing for years. So that's where we're getting some of these ideas. Now, back to this chart, I've got some little purple uh, dots on this one for things that people are going to, um, are going to talk about. Um, if if we make 16 core chips, we'll just switch one of the cores off when it's shipped, and there's no way you'll ever be able to switch that on um, after the fact. Right. Um, so thread strength's going up. We'll come back to that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about AI right at the end. Uh, ISA is an instruction set architecture, so that's new instructions for the new data. Uh, the open memory interface, absolutely vitally important for the, the next uh, four years in the computer industry. The power Exion, that's the interface um, this says uh, SMP uh, interconnect. This is the interface between power 10 chips uh, to make it look like one big computer. Well, that's what it is. So that's how we communicate between the chips. Uh, and power uh, the uh, PCI Gen 5 interface uh, with the power 9 computers. We're on Gen 4. Each generation doubles the bandwidth out to the adapters. So it's quite a big jump in performance. Okay. Now, there is official pictures um, on one of the IBM news. I think it's like uh, newsroom.ibm.com. So I, I just snuck those out so you can have a look at them. This is one of the uh, silicons in here. One day when I get bored, I'll uh, count the number of chips. You can see some of the chips sort of flow off the edge. You know, half of a chip's missing. That's never going to work. And the answer is it's easier just to roll them all out uh, to go everywhere uh, because when you're actually making these things, uh, some of the chips may work if there's another chip next to it. Uh, it affects the way the uh, lithography works and uh, heat diffuses across the silicon wafer. But uh, there we go. Uh, this is looking in a bit more into the actual chips. 
they actually have a very special machine to break these chips out. We also have, um, when we create these things in the early days in particular, we don't actually break the chips up and mount them all and put them into the computer. We actually have a device with um, that can clamp onto a particular chip and run it inside the silicon there. And so we can go looking for the chips that actually work and, and mark those out to be removed and the others uh, go in the bin. And that means that in those very early days, when they're trying to make the, the first set of chips that actually work, they'll, they'll clamp onto it, they'll inject bytes into the caches, uh, pretend to put a, a power up interrupt into the, the right pin of the, uh, the CPU uh, and, and try and get it running. And they can write programs into the caches and, and run those and try and investigate which bits of the kit the, the CPU works and which bits don't. And then try uh, again with uh, improving those bits that uh, are proving problematic. We've already been through all those. We have uh, running chips. Now, this is something confused me. This is actually one of the chips. Um, and you can compare that to the uh, diagram we saw earlier. Um, but it's actually just in a piece of plastic, which we they use to stack up all the chips before mounting them into the, uh, the uh, sockets that actually go into the uh, computer. So um, th this is not the um, ceramic that's put into the computer with the heat sink on top. This is just a way of holding the chips to keep them safe and clean. OK, actually, when I was looking for Power 10 pictures, Quite a few people in, around the world are using Power 9 chips in their pictures. And if you know what you're looking for, you can say, ah, oh, that's not a Power 10 chip. But there we go. This is just something I thought was interesting for, to do for myself, really. But uh, over the generations that we looked at previously, the actual chips, uh, you know, the lithography goes down, but the size of the chip tends to go up. Power 6 was a... Uh, slightly unusual chip the design of, of that one that actually got to five gigahertz but it was using a technique that couldn't be maintained into the future with out of order execution you can see the power 9 chip is bigger than the power 10 chip but then we shrunk the um the transistors but then we've added more transistors so it came went down a bit and then it came back up in the actual size um, of the chips and we're looking forward to uh bed stealing and borrowing uh, some some samples of the chips that we could hand around at conferences and things this is another picture from uh, Bill Starkey. The um, in Power Te Power Nine, we were using symbol chip modules. This is the module that goes into the socket, and of course they had uh, twelve cores in them. Now we're going to fifteen, but we're going into for the S nine two four and the E nine fifty replacement models. Um, they're going to be dual chip models. Now we had those in the past. I think in Power Eight. The, uh, the scale out ones had dual chip modules, but each of the Power 8 chips only had six CPUs in them. So it was like a smaller chip, smaller version of the processor, but we had put two into the module. Now we're going to have the full scale uh, up to 15 core chips, two of them. And you think, how on earth can you do that? And this is where they concentrated some really cool uh, technology to get the energy efficient down low enough that they're not generating, they're reducing their, the amount of energy coming out of those chips so far down that we can actually put two full size ones in a module and not run into thermal uh, problems. The um, Over on the right, the four DCM sockets, that's, uh, it, I think it's the same diagram with a new chip on it that we use for the Power 9 type computers but we've got dual chip modules in here instead of single chip modules and then we have the picture the 16 way is um similar to the e980 uh, model we've seen a similar pictures for the power nines but that means the these are going to have two 15 cores so in a single socket we're going up to 30 cpu cores or you can see there is a three and a half gigahertz rating so that's public um OK, we'll move on again now. So here's some of the uh, technology in here. If you, In the middle of here, we've got a Power 9 chip, and uh, we have um, buses coming out of this, actually in three directions. But the, the first two is the Power Exion. That is used to connect the Power 10 chips to each other. So that makes it into one SMP-type machine. And that's running at a terabyte per second. That's way up on. Uh, power nine so big improvement there um 
Bill notes that these bits are on the four corners of the machine, so you have four ways of talking to uh, the other chips. Then well, we actually had Power X on in Power 9. They're just highlighting the term a bit more these days. And it says that this is a Swiss Army uh, multi-protocol flexible modular interface. It means we're running the similar sort of bus to the other Power 9 processors, and we're running a similar sort of bus. You know, the internal technology is the same speed, but it's also going out to this thing called OMI memory, which is open memory interface memory. Oh, there we go. Um, and that's down the sides of the chip. And that's got a terabyte uh, a second coming in. Now, there's no workload that we can run on any processor that could deal with a terabyte of data arriving every single second. But the important point is, it's very fast with very low latency. So when we want more data into the processor to have some more instructions to run or more data to work on, then it comes in very fast. We're not waiting for the memory to catch up. It's coming in at a very high speed. And again, once we change data, we need to push that out to memory or perhaps that out onto um, NVMe disks and things, then we can push it out equally as fast so that the processor is not waiting for the data to come in or to go, get out of the way. And we can see there the OMI memory is six times the bandwidth per millimeter of DDR4 signaling. So it's a lot faster than DDR4 that we have in our low end machines in Power 9. So this, uh, this diagram shows you better on the left hand side all, all those connections, the Exion, power Exion connections that we've had before, but at a higher speed now, are connecting all the processor chips in the computer. Then on the right hand side, we have this new OMI memory. Now, with the time period where Power 10 is coming out, we've still got um, DDR4 memory that's been out for a good number of years now. Um, and DDR5 will come out in the in the time span of Power 10. So what do you do? Do you put DDR4s in, and then in DDR5 you have to reorganize the uh, the main chip. Then you have to reorganize all your memory. Then you have to reorganize all your motherboards and produce another range of computers. Or do you go to something a bit more flexible? Well, we don't want to run Power 10 memory at the same speed as power nine right i mean it was good in its day but things have moved on so we want something that's faster than uh, ddr4 right now and this is where these oem uh, memory is coming in you can see some numbers up in there um and so i pinched some pictures of this of the internet so we're familiar with ddr4 memory if you've got a recent pc this is what it's what it's going to have in it um there it's you, you can see hundreds of pins in there that that's um because it's a parallel interface, so all the bits present uh, at one time, and there's clocking things going on in here. There's a protocol running over the top, and I, I'm told by the Power Nine and Ten person involved with the memory architecture, uh, DDR4 is pretty clunky. <laughs> so you can ask the chip, like, "Are you ready?" And it will say, "No." And you think, "Well, what, what can I do now?" Right, okay. So, you, so in your hardware, you have to write, run sort of timeouts and wait for so many microseconds. And you have to ask it again, are you ready? And it may say, yes, I'm ready in a bit. I've got to flush the out and put the sum checks on the end of the, what you just sent me. And then you have to go back later on. Are you ready now? And you say, yes. And you send it the data and then it doesn't respond. So you ask, did you catch that? And it says, no, I didn't catch that. You're too quick. And you have to go, go around this great big complicated protocol to get the data out actually into the DDR4. So when we add, when we have our own centaur memory that we've had in the past in our enterprise machines or the OMI memory in here, we actually are talking to a chip here, not just dumb uh, memory, with the little controller attached. Um, now it says microchip in here. That's not generic microchip. To, that is a manufacturer called microchip ch chip. And uh, that's already available. You'll see there's a lot less pins and that's because it's coming over a serial interface. So this allows you to actually go quite a lot faster than the parallel. The problem with parallel is that all those bits of information in a byte have to arrive at the same time. And if not, you have to wait for the last bit to arrive. And so that's a lot of timing issues. With serial, you just blast the data out and the microchip will catch that and, and put it into the actual memory. Now, if you look carefully, uh, yeah, you probably see it. The actual chips on the DDR4 
memory are the same they're the black square chips in here you'll see there's nine of them so that's the extra one for parities and things um then uh, those chips are actually the same except now we're talking over an open memory interface at higher speeds to get better uh, bandwidth in and out of our memory and these are actually uh, just becoming available now from microchip so that's, that's very good news for power 10 um if providers of chips that we were going to rely on are late in delivering them and making them available then it can affect the delivery of our own computers but in this case they're already becoming available hence i've got a picture of them and you can see them on the internet it's also quite a bit smaller um so that allows um yes smaller which means it takes up less space in the computer so you can have more of these uh open in omi uh, dims actually inside the machine so that's uh, another win in that case as well okay now, this is pointing out the fact as Power Axion is to talk to Power 10 chips and OMI memory is to talk to the new class of memory that goes at a higher speed. Uh, this diagram shows that um, if we have DDR4 OMI memory in the initial computers, we could pull out all those out and push in DMI DDR5 as an upgrade later on. That should go faster, right? Um, and then you could reuse the DDR4 ones in one machine uh, you know, double the memory in that machine and this machine would have the extra special faster memory in the future that's a lot less work than reorganizing re-engineering your chip and your dims and your slots and your motherboards so that's a very quick path to upgrading to ddr5 when it becomes available right um what else we got on this chart uh i believe you can see my arrow here over here on the right we there are some special computers that are doing this already and we want to make sure that power 10 can equally uh, work with these sorts of things so we have in here storage class memory so this is a device that goes on the the memory bus for want of a better word um, it just has to obey the omi rules um, in which case this could be uh, much much larger you may get um, you know uh 256 gigabytes of memory on a omi uh, device you might have uh, five or ten terabytes perhaps on a larger storage class memory and make it persistent as well so that if you get a power off all that memory contents is saved it's going to come in at memory speeds behind the covers it may be quite a different sort of device and people are already using this for things like um the um, storage machines uh, are using power nine computers and having some devices like this pushed into them we also can um, get access to the gddr fast memory this is the memory that goes onto graphics adapters it's got quite a higher uh, performance rate and costs quite a lot that's why these adapters cost quite a lot of money but again if we bolt on an OE omi interface on that we could plug these into our power 10 computers as well over on the left hand side we got scm again so this is a storage class memory device but now it's attached to the open capi memory uh, interface so this is now pretending rather than being pretending to be a piece of memory and actually doing something behind the covers that we're not aware of this is now pretending to be another power 10 chip so it's getting the data at open capi uh, interface and we can also connect in asyncs and fpgas the accelerators that we've already seen in there up the top in here we actually have a memory cluster now i'm going to take a little drink here for a second hold on Why well, Nigel is doing that. Um, if you have uh, questions and you have been um, typing in some questions into the chat window, and I really like to thank Gareth Coates for handling many of those. So um, we, we will uh, look at those and uh, see what we can do. Thanks, Jyoti. Um So the idea is over the Power Exion interface, as well as talking to other Power 10 chips, we could have a you know a cable that comes out the back of the machine and goes into a different machine um, in one sense that's a little bit like the e980 currently does but let's make it into a cluster so we can actually have maybe the the um, scale out type machines and a 
can't, can't quickly do the best. Maybe we got 50 machines in that cluster. And that, that, so a chip on the, the bottom right in here can talk to all its buddies up this chain and across here to get to this one um, at power exion speeds. This is the, the SMP buffer type, bus type uh, speeds. Again, one terabyte a second. But that means this power 10 chip could get access to, you know, read and write the memory. Well, normally it'll be in another chip with the memory attached to it, but now we can actually go to another server with a memory attached to it. So rather than going up to like the power nine goes up to 64 terabytes of memory, we could go up to several pentabytes of, of memory. Now, there's a little thing at the bottom of this chart that says uh, some of these configurations are capability only. So those aren't planned for our regular power nine type machines that we're going to replace with power 10. Um, but it is an option we have. We have a bus that we could do that with. And I think the idea is we're trying to hedge all our bets. If that is the way computers go in the time period of power 10 is uh, the fastest computers you can get, then we're ready to build computers like that. So there we go. Um, and uh, the Power 10 chip designers love to talk about these uh, exotic technology. We just need some customer that says, yes, I'll buy $10, million or $10 billion worth of that. And then the, uh, the designers and the uh, um, server uh, technical people can go off and, and build those things, have enough budget to test them and get them out and ready for particular customers. So if, you, if you've got a spare brilliant, let us know, and maybe we'll go and build you one of these. And if we build it for one person, we can then sell that to everybody else as well. Down the bottom, I've also included the uh, PCIe Gen 5 uh, adapters. These are regular adapters. Gen 5, as I said, was two times the speed of Gen 4, which is two times the speed of Gen 3. When we power up the machine, the chip talking to the PCIe adapters negotiates. So if you put in a Gen 3 adapter into a Gen 5 slot, the process will work out, you know, can you do Gen 5? No. Can you do Gen 4? No. Can you do Gen 3? Yes. Okay, we'll talk Gen 3 speeds and off you go. So you can use some of those old adapters in your current or older machines and bring them up to the uh, Power 10 machines, which is good news. And we'll get more Gen 5 adapters as line speeds go up. So, um, you know, particularly the, the network's going very fast these days. And so the next generation will have Gen 5 ready so that the PCIe connection isn't the bottleneck. OK, now um, ignore the line on the right in here, which is about memory. The rest of them are about uh, CPU performance. So. If we sit down at the bottom, this is a dual socket server. So if this is a power, the blue one is the reference of one with power nine, S924 type machine. Um, if we're doing integer maths, then in the power 10 machine, it's going to be three, more than three times the speed, which is fairly scary. Now, you could argue that one times you know, getting to two, that's because we're now having two chips uh, in the in the module. Um, rather than one chip in the module. But if you like, uh, so that's not really cheating because we had to do a awful lot in reducing the energy, the electricity going in to actually get that in there and for it not to overheat. So it's a different way of get boosting your performance by concentrating on reducing the uh, the energy going in. The rest of it, if you like, the, the two to three, that's because that's the power 10 effect. Uh, of the, how much faster the CPU is. And some of it is uh, because we got 15 cores instead of 12, but anyway. Um, the same goes with enterprise. This is the, uh, you know, the typical workloads. IBM analyzes what people do with their computers to plan the next generation. So we look at the guys running all the popular databases, you know, DB2 and Oracle. We look at all the big applications, the SAPs of the world and regular applications written in Java, look at those instructions and try and work out how we can get those instructions. They're the ones we really want to uh, concentrate on. Same thing with floating points. Um, floating point, if you like, has moved off into GPUs, but uh, we can actually do it on the main processor as well, and that's going to be three times the speed, so that's good. Now, the graph on the, the line on the right <laughs> is about a memory streaming application. As I said, you can't write a program that can take a terabyte of uh, data per second and just 
just add the numbers up for it would take longer than than they, we have time before the next terabyte arrives. But you can see in here that if we use DDR4 memory, we'll be still be going at the at the one rating of the Power 9 uh, computer. With OMI, we're getting two and a bit times better throughput on a memory streaming application uh, because that's the whole point of adding OMI. And later on, uh, two, three years time, perhaps the DDR5 memory comes available. We could take those uh, OMI DIMMs out, put the DDR5 DIMMs in, and we get the extra performance to four times uh, the performance. So you can see why OMI is important in here, because it gives us a performance boost on the memory side uh, of, that we need to keep the Power 10 chips uh, supplied with data and instructions. Right, more details. Let's get into this. Okay, maybe more than you really want. So this is looking a little bit uh, inside the the chip. So we're going to have um, for enterprise, we have the top diagram up up in here. This is an SMT Core uh, eight, and as they they've doubled and quadrupled the number of things actually inside the chip. So practically every if we had eight threads active, every one has its own computer uh, it's like a it's mini core inside the actual core and they can actually share resources so if one thread has has you know in this next instruction cycle five integer ads it can actually use the bits of the other cores or other threads part of the process to actually do those all in one instruction cycle but anyway this is diagram in here is saying this is one or two threads so we're only running you know two threads perhaps um, on this particular core at the moment, there's not enough threads to keep all eight busy. So you can see there's a light blue and a darker blue side. So it effectively splits the the core in half and completely isolates those two threads. So there's no interference or clashing. At the top in here, we have the, the instruction uh, cache and the instruction buffer. This allows us to, to plan which parts of the core each instruction will actually be using. And if we split it in half, then the one thread gets one half and the other one gets the other, and they don't clash at all. So that produces very low interference between the threads. If we go down to the bottom one here, we've got eight threads running. We split the core into four, and there's two cores on each of these uh, double sliced mini cores in here. So again, this reduces the interference of these things, and that only happens because we've added more of these things in here. So these are like, um, well, load and store is getting things in and out of memory, but they're also like um, compare and branch, uh, integer, mass, you know, plus, minus, divide, and uh, times, um, increment, um, and those, those sorts of operations, and for the floating point and some of the new exotic ones that we're actually adding. So they all isolate. So that means the threads, when you go up to eight threads, they're, they're very powerful in their own right. That's the point. So our thread strength's gone up yet again. Power 9 was a pretty big jump. We're going up again with uh, Power 10. Okay, I'm not going to cover the rest of those things in this slide. This is uh, security. Oh, it's an important point to have security. Oh, and you also have to... IBM, I'm an IBM, so every slide deck has to have OpenShift. So there's a picture with OpenShift on it. AIX, IBM, I, Linux... Can run in VMs or in uh, be used for OpenShift and containers. There we are. So uh, the little stars around in here. Down here we got crypto performance. So I've heard of AES and SHA three. There's algorithms that are very popular and being used. There's some new ones coming out. PQC and FHE. Well, they're already built into the accelerators inside the chip and multiple of them. We have this uh, dynamic execution control register. The um, this is helping us around the problems that are created by uh, side channels, so we can switch off these when some particular instructions when needed. Uh, so that's spectre meltdown sort of problems down in here. This is the side channel avoidance in here. So we got performance, so we can switch back on that feature, but not run into the security problems of spectre meltdown or that class of uh, problem. This is the big one down the bottom right, um, main memory encryption. I, mean, I, I was listening to lectures on this uh, three years ago and they were designing all this. And he, we were, <laughs> Gareth and I were looking at each other thinking, 
are they insane? <laughs> if you encrypt memory, how is that going to operate? Well, the answer is it's actually encrypted and decrypted as it comes into the uh, the processor. So each thread has an encryption key uh, to decrypt the memory that it has access to. And so the, the memory out there is encrypted. And if another thread tries to read the data from uh, your thread, then it hasn't got the key, so it can't decrypt the data. It will get back a block full of random noise, uh, random numbers that uh, even if it does get your memory, it's of no use to it at all. We've also got this hardening of containers. Uh, containers, OpenShift, uh, Kubernetes are becoming much more important uh, since Power 9 came out. So we've got some um, special ways of isolating the memory in containers. Of course, containers have an enormous amount of overlapping memory. They only uh, have unique memory if they try to write to something. They, they do copy on writes. You know, that's how you do containers and make them uh, start very fast and be very efficient in your memory use. So that's um, already built in. Uh, the isolation is improved. Then we have this idea of uh, you can run Power VM on your computer. That gives you virtual machines or LPARs as we used to call them. Um, and then on top of that, if you install uh, Linux, then you have a KVM and you can run uh, kernel virtual machines that way. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've got to be careful what I say next. Um, this is now called nested virtualization, KVM on PowerVM. And the marketing uses a whole bunch of slides on this, and I can't help thinking we've been doing that for 10 years. I don't know what they're banging on about. I think it's more important that the idea is that we're not running KVM native on the processor anymore. Well, you can never do that. It's actually a copy of Linux with KVM running native on the computer, so we're not doing that anymore. But if you, that's what you want to do, you use PowerVM to make a one virtual machine, which is the whole machine, <laughs> and then you run KVM on top of that, which almost boils down to exactly the same thing. Okay, so security all over the place. We've investigated what we can do actually in the hardware to do it extremely fast and not to affect the performance of our applications. Right, so we're now going to turn our focus towards the servers, the Power 10 servers. Got to be really careful here because I love my job. Um, right, now I'm assuming you have some familiarity of the Power 9 servers. Don't worry, I've got a picture in a second. And um, we, I've looked at the Power 10 public uh, presentations, the, the videos that are available and those sorts of things from uh, Bill and friends. Um, and there, there's references in those that the Power 10 servers will have um, a, a two socket, a four socket, and a 16 socket sort of design. And that sort of rang bells with me, because if we look at um, <coughs> the Power 9 servers, we have the scale out models, the S924 and his half height brother, um, and they run 24 cores, four terabytes of memory. And this is uh, two sockets. Then we have the four socket model, the E950, uh, 48 cores, so that's uh, four 12s. Uh, chips in there, 16 terabytes of memory, and the big bogs, the E980 with 16 sockets, and that gets us up to 192 cores, 64 terabytes of uh, memory. So I said, well, let's, uh, let's imagine here, I'm not just telling you anything that you can't work out for yourself here. Let's say, we took those boxes and um, we we actually put Power 10 chips in them. What, what will they start looking like? So I'll, I'll highlight in here that the Power 8 and the Power 9 machines have very similar sets of servers. And we have a little game at the office where you can show your picture. Is that the Power 8 model or the Power 9 model? And you might recognize that there's two millimeters thinner on this particular bit of the outside of the box. Um, so very similar servers. The Power 7 was weren't uh, dissimilar as well. So Let's assume that the power tens will be similar. We know the number of sockets in these machines could well be very similar. Um, and I'm not, this isn't uh, an IBM statement, uh, my guesswork, all right? So you have to take it with a pinch of salt. But what would actually happen here? For the scale out model then, two sockets, dual chip models, fixed um, 15 cores per uh, chip. So in here we have two sockets, two chips in each socket, so that's four chips, that's 60 cores. 
Now, I have a bad habit of tending to call the scale out the bottom end mo models. <laughs> um, uh, but, yeah, and then 24 core and 4 terabytes, man, that's a serious server, isn't it? But now we're going to 60 cores in our scale out models and PCI Gen 4 and uh, PCI Gen 5 as well. That's a serious computer. That more than doubles the number of cores in our scale out. Then he said smaller end. Okay, in, in the middle, what would happen? Well, we now get to 120 cores, similar sort of thing. This is one of the pictures uh, actually that uh, Bill Starkey has in his presentation. So we have four sockets, each with dual chip modules in here. So you do the maths, you get 120 cores in here. Because there's a lot of power 10 chips, we probably um, all the PCI slots can be Gen 5 in this sort of, sort of model, as we've had with uh, Power 9, with Gen 4. Okay, and then if we go for the big ones, we go to a hundred, sorry, 240 cores in here. Same mass. Of course, the, the, the big machine, um, we have um, all the connections between the other CPUs in uh, your 5U box. Then you have the, the cables that come out the back that joins all the cores from one 5U box to the other box and to the other and to the other. So that all those uh, power Axion connectors are built exactly to allow us to have these uh, 16 socket uh, modules and run them at full speed as one SMP type server. But we've managed to get to uh, 240 cores in there. Okay, so this is... I haven't, that, I haven't announced anything here, right? Please. <laughs> Okay, so a reminder, that's not an announcement, uh, public facts, made an assumption, a little bit of guesswork, and that's what we get to with the Power 9, uh, Power 10 servers. A few other bits of information to, to finishing off now. Of course, the enterprise is where IBM focuses our, our Powerbox primarily. And okay, we can do high-performance computing and uh, a bit of AI and those sorts of things on them. Um, and... We can see in here, this is a Bill's chart again, uh, the core average core performance coming up 30%. The average single thread performance comes up 20%. And uh, then if you add in the dual core modules, then we've got three times the performance at a socket level. Of course, we still have two sockets, so that works out for the, the scale out machines. Um, also in here, as I said earlier, the artificial intelligent workloads have, have come much more to the fore and it's a very hot area in the computer industry so the guys were looking at how could the power 10 processor actually help out with ai workloads now i didn't know this but i've learned since if you're doing a high performance computing you get uh, floating point numbers uh, 64 bits and you want every last bit of accuracy in there that's because when you start multiplying lots of floating point numbers, the, the last bits, if you like, um, have to be rounded up or rounded down uh, when because the, the, the accuracy falls off, if you like, um, each time you do maths. And so your accuracy of your numbers goes down as you do more and more maths. So they're like very, very high resolution uh, you know, decimal points, numbers are the decimal point to do their maths so they don't lose any important information as these rounding errors come in as you do more and more maths. But in, in, in artificial intelligence, that's not necessarily the case. Now, when you're doing the building of the models, you're going through thousands and thousands of permutations of trying to work out, would this rule let us split the two images perhaps that we're looking at into two different classes uh, you know this is this person's got cancer this hasn't so you try thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of different rules trying to work out which rules would actually apply to actually very clearly split the the good and the bad uh, images that you're looking at when it comes to doing the inferencing you're only running the the working rules the the small set of working rules that allow you to work out whether it's cancer or not, it's a dog or a cat, uh, or this person's speeding, or, or whatever it is you're, you're looking at. So those workloads don't need the high precision of the normal floating point numbers that you get in a general purpose uh, computer like this. 
What they prefer is, is uh, they're doing a lot of uh, matrix maths. So they prefer in one 64-bit register, they prefer two or uh, four smaller numbers and then do the same maths with all of those four numbers in a clock cycle. This is what SIMD is about, single instruction, multiple data. So you have an instruction of you add one and it will do that to lots of registers at the same time. And if you can squeeze four smaller precision numbers in there, that's exactly what the AI guys need because they're not doing mass and mass and mass and mass. They're just looking at these uh, for a small amount of time and they're not so worried about the accuracy that you're going to get. You're not working on, you know, the hundreds of hundreds of a percent is not going to swing it from, from a dog to a cat. It's like, is, is it 90% a cat or 40% a cat is uh, what you're trying to differentiate when you're looking at images, an example. So this is where we, we've actually um, added extra instructions and added extra data types inside the Power 9 core, sorry, Power 10 core, um, to allow these sorts of AI workloads to be done on the main processor. And for some classes of AI, this is going to be more than enough to actually get the, the thing done without having to uh, offload this onto a AI type computer to do the, uh, the maths for us. Okay, now this ASI this instruction set architecture, these are all the instructions that you can ask a processor to do. The, um, the top right there, it says they've added 200 more instructions and matching data types into the Power 10 uh, processor. If you can imagine the instructions come in at 64 bits um, and there's only a couple of hundred different instructions of so the last bulk of that 64 bits, you know, there's a few, there's a byte down one end that tells you is this an add or a multiply. There's a couple of bits that tell you which register you wanted to do it on, and then the rest of it is unused. So they've used those extra bits in there to specify these new types of instructions and uh, matching uh, data types in here. So they've added a whole bunch of new things into the uh, processor and changed the ISA to 3.1. So we've got a whole bunch of new instructions. That doesn't matter for regular techies. Uh, the people that really care are the compilers. They may say, wow, that's a really good technique in there. We can make use of that. All the people that are writing high performance computing libraries or artificial intelligence libraries, they will be going down to assembler to use these new instructions and new data types to get a performance boost. The people that are actually using AI or crunch general numbers are unaware of that. They just uh, recompile uh, or use the new version of the library and, and they get the performance boost without actually having to do any of the hard work. So here, here's some examples in here and we can see um, a Limpax, uh, a high performance um, benchmark in industry, it's been out for years and years. It's probably almost the first one that everybody runs just to check the floating point numbers work. Uh, so we're getting a 10 times performance leap in that. Then we have these other uh, benchmarks in here, FP32, so that's two 32-bit floating points in a register. Uh, the B float is a slightly different organization that where the bits are put, uh, but they can put four of those into a, a register, and then the int 8 is even, even more, but integers, not floating point. And you can see we're getting big numbers of a performance boost uh, in those sorts of workloads that can make use of these new data types. Okay, so here's the my summary for a regular techie. Last two or three slides in here. So what are the performance gains, speeds and feeds? Um, so the Power Number 10's got these 15 cores, that's 25% up. We've got the dual chip modules, that's 100% up. Then we've got the thread strength uh, going up, being improved by 20%. And so if you add all those up together, we're going three times faster than a Power 9 core. As a few little caveats here, this is comparing the two socket version of Power 9 and Power 10. And uh, these are our expected performance uh, improvements. And we're doing that, that that's all on, on the processor, but we're matching all that with the Power X on the, the joining the Power 10 chips together, the new memory interface to give us higher bandwidth out to memory, and Gen 5 adapters. There's not many Gen 5s out at the moment, but in a year's time, when Power 10 becomes available, there'll be more, and, and over the 
at a four-year life cycle of uh, the Power 10 generation, there would be a lot more for very high-speed networking, for example, maybe fiber channels as well. And uh, generally, we're moving to uh, NVMe disks for the performance that gives you compared to brown spinning disks. They're practically being phased out. Um, so there's no internal bandwidth limitations to slow down all these performance gains that you get with your processor. Another way of looking at it is in the same size server, the 2U, 4U uh, machines, then uh, we can expect the similar electricity use. That's sort of a, a given for the past uh, four or five generations, really, I think. Um, but we get more higher performance. So that's a good green credentials. Hence, it's, I put that in green. That's the transactions per watt. You use the same electricity, but you do three times more transactions than the transactions per watt is three times better. So practical things that you could say already that uh, for people you know, in the computer room, uh, some hands on. Um, if we have uh, stronger, faster cores and threads, then we could, if you've got an LPAR with uh, 15 CPUs in it, we can take that down to 10 and we reduce the core counts and that reduces the software license costs. Everybody wins in that case. We could also have um, larger virtual machines. If we have a, a 4U box and um, we have uh, 24 cores in a power nine and 60 in the bigger one, we can make those virtual machines much bigger and uh, reduce system admin workload because there's, all the VMs are bigger and got more than enough uh, CPU to do all their work. Um, so same with the mid range, we do the calculations. You can have uh, two 58 core uh, virtual machines instead of 20 core. Um, in the virtual, we could actually put more virtual machines in a server. So if we were aiming at a uh, machine with two 10 core virtual machines we could take that down a bit because they're faster we could have seven eight core virtual machines the two to seven uh, ratio and i've added in a, saving a few cpus for the, the vi servers similar sort of thing with the the mid-range so server consolidation is going to work a treat on these machines we'll have less servers running more virtual machines or massive sized virtual machines allowing for growth in their applications uh, we can reduce uh, rack space, floor space, electricity if we're switching off some of the older machines and uh, consolidating to power 10. Uh, less network connections because we can go to fire faster speeds and um, less VO servers in our boxes to uh, share out the workload. There's a whole bunch of other arguments in price performance, but we don't have prices and we don't have the performance numbers apart from the relative performance with uh, power 9 expect those to come out when that information is available so and i'm done right so uh ha quite happy to answer questions uh, i've seen uh gareth and friends answering a whole bunch of those we don't really want dates i've said everything i can on that price is no idea uh, our person cpu does no idea gigahertz we we know the, the ballpark range is about the same as power nine when it boils down to model names nobody knows that until marketing make up their mind and I don't know the the winning numbers for the lotto either, so don't ask me. <laughs> the um, are there any other questions out there, Jody? Um, I think most of them have been handled by Gareth or what right. you ran through in the in the session. I just wanted to say um, so apologies apologize for overrunning slightly to everyone who's participating. Thank you for being patient, and thank you very much, Nigel, for covering. Um, a very exciting topic area and thanks to Gareth for handling so many of the questions. Um, as usual, the replay for this will be available as soon as I can get it, um, get hold of it and uh, post it and I will send an email, uh, replay email with all the details uh, as well as some of the other resources I mentioned at the beginning of the session. Um, I just want to take the time while while any more questions are coming in, I want to take the time to thank everyone who has supported the Powerbug series thus far and uh, hope that we've kept you educated and entertained um, as well as with the uh, numerous demos that have um, been shown in previous sessions. Obviously, we would have loved to have demoed something today, but um, it, that is uh, not possible, not feasible. So. Uh, with this topic, we will 
Leon, um, further sessions as soon as we are able to share information with you. You can be sure of that as we have done with Power9 um, servers, for example, we, you will get some early information uh, as soon as we can share that. Um, and I think uh, what one other thing I'd like uh, to ask, uh, it's a big ask of the PowerVog subscribers is, uh, if you can provide me some feedback of what you found useful, examples are always welcome. If there's any specific sessions, things that you would like to see in the future, topics, uh, and also if there's any improvements that I can make uh, in the series, would very much appreciate that. Uh, and you can just send that to me via email as per normal. Okay, um, is there anything else, Gareth, that has come in? Um, there was a question about NVMe and is it the future? And well, I think that it's more the present uh, and that everything else except maybe storage arrays is the past. Um, it strips out most of the layers of the SCSI protocol, so it makes it much more efficient. Um, and I think that I've answered pretty well everything or I've addressed everything. There were things that we couldn't answer. Um, so. Uh, you know that that's uh, that's the best I can do. If anybody else has got any questions, maybe unmute yourself, and we'll give you ten seconds to uh, ask your question. I'm going to stop the recording there because as we've already overrun, and then we can do that. Hold on a sec. Okay. <laughs>